Hey, in this video, I'm going to be going through the physical science period six midterm review. If you're watching this on period eight, you guys get a separate one, so make sure you don't watch the wrong video. Uh, all right, so we'll start with number one. What I'm going to try to do is keep a running number up in the corner so you can skip to whichever number you want to see. All right, so we took 10 milliliters of each of these four liquids and we poured them into a beaker slowly. So I'm going to split into four layers. Well, what we know about density is that the less dense something is, the uh, more likely it is to float. And since density of water is one, we can kind of gauge from there. So uh, anyway, the, it's going to form four layers. The lightest one is corn oil, so that's going to be at the top. Under that is going to be the next lightest one, which is water. Under that is the next lightest one, which is milk. And finally, the heaviest one, which is maple syrup. So again, you just look at the densities. Number two, what's the density of water? Well, it's one. And that one is gram per milliliter, or one gram per centimeter cubed. And depending on how specific, you can go 1.00. Number three, which of the four substances listed above would sink in water, which would float? Well, anything with a density higher than one is going to sink. So milk's going to sink, and uh, maple syrup's going to sink, which will float. That's going to be corn oil. Number four, what's a formula for density? D equals M over V. Remember our density fox. Like that. Number five, particle diagram for regular solid, liquid, and gas. All right. So for solids, we want them pretty close together, sort of like this. And we want to add one little whoosh line just to show that they are, in fact, moving. If they weren't moving, it'd be absolute zero, which we could never reach. Uh, for our liquid, generally want them a little further apart, spread out along the bottom. And for liquids, we get two whoosh lines to show that they are moving a little faster. They're gliding past one another. And finally, gases are going to occupy the entire volume of the container. And for gases, we do four whoosh lines. We skip right past three. And that just represents the fact that gas particles are moving so much faster than a liquid. It's a huge jump from L to G. So that's going to give us uh, twice as many whoosh lines. Okay, number six. <clears throat> Before and after diagram of a solid heating up. Okay, so here's my original solid, just like we had before, with one whoosh line. And when solids heat up, they expand. Basically, the particles start moving a little bit faster, allows them to get a little more space between. So we're going to draw a little bit more spread out like, oh, not two whoosh lines. I still want to give it one whoosh line, but I'm going to exaggerate that whoosh line, make it a little bit larger to show that it really is moving a lot. Two whoosh lines would be a liquid. All right. Number seven. List two plus real life examples of thermal expansion of solids. Well, one great example is uh, bridges expanding. Bridges have gaps in them. Uh, if those gaps weren't there, when the solid expanded, it would have nowhere to go and it would buckle and crack and twist. Uh, because the gaps are there, it allows the bridge to kind of expand into itself during hot months. Uh, another example is railroad tracks that kind of uh, buckle. Every now and then you might see uh, you know, some kind of movement like this and that happens because the railroad tracks uh, don't have enough space between them and they heat up and they they expand. Uh, let's see if I can think of any other examples. Um, a lot of times people will get like a wedding ring stuck on their finger in the uh, cold months and that's because uh, when the metal is cold it'll kind of shrink a little bit 
And one way, to, if you have a wedding ring trapped on your finger, one way to take it off is to run the ring under water, try to try not uh, under hot water, try to avoid um, getting too much on your skin. And if you can heat just the ring up, that ring's gonna expand, allows you to pull the ring off. Okay, number eight. Sketch a particle diagram of a liquid heating up, not H2O. Pretty much the same thing as with the solid. So I'll draw my particles down at the bottom, two whoosh lines like this. And with the liquid, same thing. The particles move faster and they start to expand out a little more. So I want to kind of draw this a little more expanded like that. And it sometimes even helps. You can draw like a water level and show the water level rising. So same two whoosh lines, but now we're going to exaggerate it to show they're going a little bit faster. Number nine, list two plus real life examples of expansion of liquids. Uh, one example is a thermometer. Basically, you have a thermometer tube like this. Inside is a chamber, and we have some kind of liquid in there. Okay, when you put this inside something hot, uh, the liquid is going to expand, and it can do one of two things it can shatter the glass if the glass is too weak, or more likely, it's going to rise up. It's going to expand. It is only one place to go up. So a thermometer is a good example. Another example you can think of is uh, global warming related to sea level rise. Um, it's true that a lot of the water, uh, that the sea level rise is due to uh, Arctic glaciers. Um, so I shouldn't really say Arctic. It's really the glaciers that are up on landforms. So Greenland and Antarctica, when those glaciers melt, they do run water into the ocean and that raises sea level. But that's only a little bit of it. Most of the sea level rise we see is because when water heats up, it expands. Um, another example you could think, um, when, when uh, liquids are kind of, well, an example someone came up with in one of my classes, their family um, makes pasta sauce, and when they put the pasta sauce in a jar, uh, the water level is right at the top of the pasta level, the, the sauce level. Uh, and then after they cool down, it kind of shrinks down a little bit more. So it just shows that when they're hot, they expand. When they're cool, they contract. Number 10. Sketch solid and liquid H2O. Be sure to pay attention to the orientation of the molecules. How is it different? All right. So for solid H2O, we want to draw our water molecules but we want to make sure that they're arranged in such a way that the, it's not quite correct here, that the hydrogens on one are slightly attracted to the oxygens on another. These are called hydrogen bonds. And when you do this enough, you create this kind of empty space in the middle. And it's important that you show space in the middle when it comes to solid. Uh, and that's because solid ice kind of expands out a little bit, bulks out. Uh, for liquid water, there are some of those attractions, but they're not quite as much. Basically, the water is moving too fast for those attractions to really hold anything in place. So really, when it comes to the density, this should be drawn a little bit more dense. We just have a little bit less air trapped inside there. Why is this different? Well, again, it's these hydrogen bonds in the solid phase and to a lesser extent in the liquid phase that cause uh, the solid to kind of bulge out. H2O is one of the few uh, substances, one of the few compounds that actually expands when it freezes. Most things uh, contract when they freeze. Use this example before. If you, take, um, if you take a chunk of steel and throw it into a vat of molten steel, it's going to sink. If you take uh, um, solid copper and throw it into a vat of liquid copper, it's going to sink. However, if you take H2O solid and throw it into a, a pot of H2O liquid, it's going to float. Number 11. What is temperature? Temperature is a measure of the average kinetic energy of the molecules, or in other words, it's how fast they're moving. Number 12 which is a higher temperature, an ice cube or Mr. S's 25 liter flask of liquid nitrogen. With temperature, it's common sense. The liquid nitrogen is about negative 196. 
the ice cube is 0 to negative 10. So the ice cube definitely has a higher temperature. Again, with temperature, it's common sense. 13, what is heat? Heat's a measure of the total movement of molecules inside some kind of system. So a good example we always use is the icy pond. Uh, the icy pond, the molecules are all moving very slowly, but there's so much of them that if you add it up, the total amount of movement, it's going to be a lot, an incredible amount of heat. Uh, so question 14 says, which is more heat in ice cube or the flask of liquid nitrogen? In this case, the liquid nitrogen is going to have more heat, even though the average molecule is moving a lot slower because there are so many more molecules moving in the uh, nitrogen, it's going to have more heat. 15. Boiling points and freezing points of water in Celsius. That's 100 and 0. 16. Several examples of heat transfer by conduction. Conduction is all about direct contact. So my hand on the smart board conducting heat. When I touch uh, an ice cube, heat conduction. When you fry something like an egg frying on a frying pan, conduction. When you step outside and air particles collide with your body and either cool you down or heat you up, that's conduction. Anything that's directly contacting something else, including air, that is conduction. 17. Convection. Convection is all about the movement of heat upwards through gases and liquids. So one good example is uh, water heating up inside a beaker that's on a hot plate or on some kind of flame like this. Okay, So first of all, uh, if it's like a hot plate like that, there's conduction happening here. And what happens is the water down here heats up first. Again, that's still conduction. And that water is going to move up to the top because the water molecules expand, the density drops, and it floats up to the top. Well, it doesn't leave a vacuum down there. Something has to replace it, so cold water is going to rush down to replace it. Well, now this cold water is going to heat up relative to that water, and that's going to rise, and that's going to sink, and so on. This is a convection uh, cell or convection cycle. Another example is um, a lava lamp. Lava lamp basically is something like this, and usually has this, like, uh, use orb-like uh, materials in them. And the basic idea of a lava lamp is under here, it's a heat source, and it heats up the material here, causes it to rise to the top, and at the top, it, cool material is going to sink down below, so it's a constant up and down movement. 18. Radiation. Well, everything gives off radiation, so you can really list many things. The sun, great example of radiation. Radiation is any heat that travels through space in waves. So sunlight or heat from the sun, uh, a campfire. If you're sitting next to a campfire, that's a good example because it's convection is what rises up. Conduction is if you touch it. And uh, radiation is if you're just sitting next to it because you're receiving those waves of uh, heat. Um, if you look at an infrared camera, you see different colors. Everything's giving off radiation. Right now, I'm giving off radiation. Uh, everything gives off radiation. Number 19. Fill in the table. All right. So I guess we got to list all the phase changes. We got to say whether they're endo or exothermic. So freezing is done for us. So let's talk about melting. Well, melting is going to be uh, solid to liquid. So we're going from slow to medium. So in order to do that, the molecules need to speed up. So melting is going to be endothermic. Melting is solid to liquid, endo, endothermic. Um, we will do vaporization. Vaporization is liquid to gas. In order to do this, we go from medium to fast. Thus, the particles must pick up energy, absorb energy, endothermic. Condensation. gas to liquid. The particles go from fast to medium. They have to slow down. In order to slow down, they have to dump their heat off. Exothermic. Sublimation. 
solid directly into a gas. They go from slow to fast. In order to do, to do that, they have to pick up a lot of energy, endothermic. And finally, deposition. Deposition, gas down into a solid. In order to do this, the particles need to slow down very quickly. And to slow down, they have to dump their heat off, exothermic. 20. Draw the heating curve of water. Five steps. One, two, three, four, five. Right here we have a solid, well, I'll go through all five. Solid heating up, uh, solid turning into a liquid, liquid heating up, liquid turning into a gas, and gas heating up. So the two plateaus here are melting, solid into liquid, and vaporization, uh, liquid into gas. 21. Draw the cooling curve of water. Same thing, but it's backwards. Now we're cooling down a gas. Gas condenses into a liquid. Liquid cools down. Uh, liquids freezes into a solid. Solid cools down. So again, we have condensation and we have freezing. 22. You put a pot of water on the stove. After three minutes, the water is lukewarm. The metal on the side is very hot. Explain why this is in terms of specific heat capacity. Okay. Well, specific heat capacity is the amount of heat required. So that's your Q is your heat, or I should say it's joules. It's the number of joules of energy required per one gram of material per one degree Celsius. So that's the unit. Now for water, it's very high, 4.18. So in other words, for water, it takes 4.18 joules to bring every one gram up by one degree Celsius. For steel or iron, it's 0 0.45. And again, joules per gram degree Celsius. So what this means is that it only takes 45% of one joule to bring one gram of steel up by one degree Celsius. So which one heats up faster? This one, because they're given the same amount of heat, but this one only requires this much energy to go up one degree, this one requires almost 10 times as much. Okay, 23. Heat problems. You'll be given these formulas, you'll be given the constants. How much heat is required to heat up 23 grams of water by 12 degrees Celsius? Q equals MC2 delta T, this is C2 for water, uh, so heat is Q equals 23 grams times 4.18 joules per gram degree Celsius, that's my C2 value, and by 12 degrees Celsius, right there, let's check our unit, gram cancels gram, degree Celsius cancels degree Celsius, I'm left with joules, that makes sense, plug it all in, 23 times 4.18 times 12 gives me, and you don't need to worry about where to round it off, that's something you'll learn next year if you go into chemistry or another science, uh, but I'm going to round this off to, well this was my original answer, and I'm going to end that at 1200 joules. Okay. Just if you, if you care to see the basic idea behind this, this has two digits in it, like two numbers of certainty, that's three numbers of certainty, and that's two numbers of certainty. So you take the one with the fewest, so two numbers of certainty here, we call them significant figures, and this now has to get two numbers of certainty or significant figures. So I'm going to round that off to 1,200, which has my two numbers of, of significance here, and two zeros as rounded off. You don't have to worry about that till, uh, till next year. 24. An ice cube releases a certain amount of heat as it cools down. What's the mass? All right. For this one, Q equals mc1 delta t. We're dealing with a solid ice cube, so you use c1. We are solving for mass, so let's rearrange. Mass equals, let's divide by these, so it's Q over c1 delta t. Okay. Q is heat. Well, it tells us 875 joules are released. C1 is 2.10, I think, let me check. Nope, 
1.90 joules per gram degree Celsius, and delta T is minus 3 degrees Celsius. Okay. Let's check our units. Joule cancels joule. Degree Celsius cancels degree Celsius, and grams is like the inverse of the inverse down here, so that's actually going to be my unit that comes out on top. And I get 875 divided by 1.90 equals divided by uh, 3. Now, I should have made this a positive 3. All I'm looking for in my delta T, my change in temperature, is just how much it actually changed by. So 3 is fine there. You don't have to say negative 3. If you do say negative 3, just make it a positive number. Um, the answer I get was 153.508 and so on. Um, if you were actually using proper significant figures, because that's only one digit of certainty, I would actually have to round this off to 200. But for the sake of this, let's just call it 153 grams. All right, 25... Water vapor with a mass of 52 grams absorbs 22,000 joules of heat. If it started at 120, what's the final temperature? Well, we're dealing with water vapor. So now we're in C3. Okay, We're solving for the final temperature, but let's solve now for delta T. Let's get that by itself. The delta T is going to equal, we divide by that, so it's Q over MC3. Q is given as 22,000 joules. M is given as 52 grams, and C3 we look up, 1.90, or am I wrong again? Yep, 2.10 joules per gram degree Celsius. Okay, joule cancels joule, gram cancels gram, degree Celsius is my inverse of my inverse, so it comes back up onto the top as my unit. Let's plug in and see what we get. So 22,000 divided by 52 equals, divided by 2.10 equals, and I get 201.465 and so on. Uh, so I'm gonna actually round that off to, well this one's tricky if you're using proper sig figs, you gotta call it 2.0 times 10 to the second. Uh, let's just call that 201. So that's my, uh, not T, that's my degrees Celsius. Okay? But that's not the final answer we're looking for. We're looking for what's the final temperature. Well, it's going to change by 201. That's what delta T means. The change in temperature is going to be 201. Uh, but what we want to see is what's the final temperature going to be. So you go back in the problem and you look for clues of where, whether it's going to go up or down. So we see that it absorbs this amount of heat. So that's a clue that it's going to go up. So we're starting at 120. It's going up by 201. It's going to give us 321 degrees Celsius final temperature. Okay. I'm going to stop here. You can start the next video for the next problems.